Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. The season of Lent is a time to recognize our frailty and to recognize God's amazing grace in our lives. And uh, this morning, um, we are going to sing songs that acknowledge that, that acknowledge who God is in our lives and what he does in our lives and how he, he makes um, beauty out of ashes. So I want to encourage you to stand and sing today as we uh, worship our mighty Savior who saves. springing up from this soul ground out of chaos life is being found in you life is found in you Lord God and you
of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just thank him today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Church, let's just take this time to say love before a mighty God. He is perfect and holy. He is beautiful. majestic Colossians 1 19 through 20 for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Amen. There's a place where mercy
wash your feet with humble tears. What would be poured out to nothing's left? And I just want to wait on you, my God. And I just want to dwell. is all we seek, Lord God. When your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds. Thank you, Father, for your presence in our lives. Thank you for who you are. So good to us. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor. You're a majestic king. Good morning, and I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to see everyone here today. 
some new faces. I, good morning. Good morning. You know, coming together is awesome. And I do miss the fact that we can't do that regularly as um, we used to be able to. And I do miss seeing friends and family. So it's good to see you. If I don't see other people right now, I'm sorry. But it's good to see you guys. Um, Let us go ahead and go to prayer. Father, we come before you to thank you for this day. For me, a day sitting in the sun this morning, just praying and reading. I thank you for that day. Lord, I thank you for the life that you give us, this time together as we commune with one another and with you. I pray, Lord Jesus, for you to come and speak to us and minister to us and allow us to minister to you and give you all praise like we've done this morning and acknowledgement of what you've done and who you are through praise and worship. Lord, I pray that you uh, speak through me and allow us to grow, Lord. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to take a second because I was lost in worship this morning and I have the schedule for the day here and it has the songs in it. And the first song is Beautiful Things. Ultimately, that's what Lent is all about, taking us and making us beautiful or more beautiful. And I was crying through that song as we sung it. The reason I think, one of the reasons why God, someone wrote this song and says that God takes ashes. And to me, when I was singing the song, I had this visual of a fire coming through a forest and wiping and devastating the forest and new growth comes back after that devastation. And my mind went all over the place in this song. <laughs> Thank you. And then we sing this next, this song down at the bottom, and it's called Beautiful. And I think the reason we can sing, someone could write that song saying beautiful things is because God himself is beautiful and is extending his beauty to us. I love that. Sorry, I had to share that little tidbit of worship with you this morning. But just to think that God is creating and renewing us in the inside. Is it what this season is about, the season of Lent? <clears throat> so if you guys would, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. And while you're turning there, or opening up your phone, this particular passage has come straight out of our Lent uh, devotional book for today, and it's the main scripture. So I'm going to put a plug in there. We don't have any right now. They're all gone, so thank you. And I hope you all are reading them and enjoying them, because personally I found um, they've been quite good. It's quite good. So... Mark chapter 2, and we're at verse 18. And in my Bible, it says, Jesus' question about fasting. And I'm just going to go ahead and read to verse 22. And it says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will be pulled away, will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into the wine sk- into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. I think it's funny. You gotta love Jesus. Hey, Jesus, how come your uh, disciples aren't um, fasting? And then Jesus comes up with this guy at the bride and bridegroom and 
And then he goes down to tell about a piece of cloth and adding a new piece of cloth. And then he goes down and talks about wine and wineskins. And, and it, it, I would be sitting here scratching my head, I think. Right? And it's an interesting passage. And to be honest, I've scratched my head the whole time I read that. Let me tell you what I wrote at the bottom of, the, of reading that. So for that little passage, and we'll come back to it, but I'm going to read you this. It says this. Jesus is saying to us, to the people at that time, prepare your hearts to meet me. Open your heart. Open your soul. Open your mind. Give me your strength so you can see and receive what I want to give to you. That's what's in that passage. That's what's there. It's a phenomenal passage, but it's kind of crazy in the way it's written. So I think to um, understand it a little bit for me, I had to go back and read some of Mark to fill in some of the blanks for me. (laughs) And uh, so I would like us to take a short little journey into Mark just going back one chapter, because we're in chapter two, so we're going to go to chapter one, and we're going to start at verse two. And the, and the titles in the NIV are important to me today. So I'm going to read what the title headings are as, as we read. So it says, John the Baptist prepares the way. That's the heading. John the Baptist prepares the way. And it reads as such. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Verse 4. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Do you see it? If we go back, this kind of goes down and up. I think my Bible's too heavy. (laughs) So, if we go back and look at that first scripture we read, they they ask questions. These guys are are fasting. Why aren't your guys fasting? And then Jesus answers in that question and says... When the bride, when the groom is around, why is there a need to fast? I hope you guys see what God, or what Jesus just called himself. He called himself God. In the Old Testament and in the New, the the groom is referred to God, and the bride is referred to the church. So that's a pretty solid statement there. Right? And now he's saying, when you are in my presence, there is no need to fast because you're in my presence. It is a time of celebration, a time to feast. Then he goes on and he talks about an old garment and sewing, putting a hole, there's a hole in my garment and he's going to sew a new patch in there with new cloth. And I don't know about you, but I do know this much. I know that if I put that new cloth on there, it will pull and then make that hole worse. And then he goes on about the wine skin. I've never drinking anything out of an animal skin, so I don't know too much about it, but I do know that leather gets rigid. And I do know that when wine ferments, it expands. And I do know that if you put new wine into old leather and it's rigid and it wants to expand, it's going to burst. I do know those things. That's not going to work. Neither is a patch on a pair of pants going to work. An old, a new cloth on an old pair of pants, it's not going to work. So then he jumps down and says, um, but if you take the new wineskin and put new wine in that wineskin, it won't burst. It won't burst break
The season of Lent is about us being pliable, moldable, to receive Jesus, to receive his message, to receive what he wants to give us. When that comes in to this vessel, my heart needs to be pliable, moldable. The gospel message is pouring into us. We need not to be rigid. Okay? Now, why did I read here? I want to take you back to Mark chapter 1, verse 2, and then go down to 5 again. If you read, it says here at verse 3, the second part, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John, to me, one day you'll hear a full sermon on John the Baptist. I love John the Baptist. But for here, we're going to stay here. And it says, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Well, how do you make a straight path in this indication, in this reference? It's answered in the next verse. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. Oh, let's prepare our hearts this season and ask God to forgive us of our sins. Let's ask him to search us deeply and let's repent and confess those sins. That is preparing the groundwork for Jesus to move within us, right? Check out verse 5. It's awesome. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by John, by him in the Jordan River. There is so much between these scriptures that we're going to read today that we don't have time for. I suggest you guys read these first two chapters. So the next scripture I want us to go to is Mark 1, 40 through 42. And it reads this. This is the title. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. All I'm going to do is read you the two scriptures. So it says this. Let me find it real quick. And then we'll read it. It says, sorry. A man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. If you ever have time, look up the word clean in the Old Testament. Filled with compassion. Oh my word, Jesus is filled with compassion. Filled, do you see it? He's filled with compassion. Jesus, this is a leper. He reaches out, touches the man. I can envision it, touching the man, the leper, the one that no one is supposed to be touching. Quite frankly, he shouldn't even be in the room. He shouldn't even be there. And Jesus reaches out and touches him. And he has compassion on him, right? Let me find my place again. Filled with compassion, Jesus reaches out his hand and touched the man. And Jesus simply says this, I am willing. He said to him, be clean. There is so much power in that word to be clean, but we're not staying there. Okay. John came to prepare the way. Let's confess our sins. The leper man A man that has people, oh, you're a leper, stay away, stay away, he's a leper. And he has to say, I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm a leper. And Jesus reaches out and touches this man and heals him and says, you are clean. He's an untouchable and Jesus came to him. This man has been told his whole life that he's untouchable. So he believes that he's untouchable. The people believe that he's untouchable. And Jesus touched him and cleaned him. Let's move on to the next one, the paralytic. We're just reading a few verses. Mark 2, 4 through 5. It says this. So many gathered that... Let me reread. So many gathered that there was no room left. I'm going to start at 1 so it makes sense. 2, 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. 
So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Preached the word, amen. Verse 3, so men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, notice the word son. Your sins are forgiven. Again, we're meeting another man, a paralytic. A man of need. A man of thinking wrong thoughts probably about himself. This man was so desperate to meet Jesus that he got his friends together. That they couldn't get to him because the crowd was so tight. So they were desperate enough to, I don't know, climb the roof? All I think about is, who's going to pay for that roof? Dug a hole through the roof? All I can think about is underneath the roof, all the people getting dirt on them. right? But here's Jesus, not even worried about any of that. He's worried about that person. And he says, because of your faith, because of your determination, because you're healed. Your sins are forgiven. Hello? Who can forgive sins? Not me. Jesus, God. Again, he's calling himself somebody. Right? I'm just pointing little things out. There's lots to point out and we're skipping over lots. Okay? So we met a leper, a paralytic man. Okay? Okay? This paralytic man, let's draw some other things out of him. He was so desperate to meet Jesus that he was willing to do just about anything to get through the crowd so he can be healed, cleaned, cleansed, right? Fixed. The other thing is, is he knew he couldn't do it alone. And sometimes on our journeys, we need to take a friend. We have God right here. He's, some, he's right here. But sometimes we need a friend to go with us, to help fight with us, to help fight for us, to dig through the roof. Right? So as we're in this Lent season, we need to possibly have a friend. Maybe to confess in. Maybe to confide in. Maybe to lift us up. Maybe to hold us up. Maybe to push us forward. Maybe to pull us back. But we need that person, right? We do. This paralytic man wouldn't have got there without his friends. We're going to go to Mark 1, 14. So while Jesus is doing all this ministry, here's just a little quick blurb right here. It says, after that, John was put into prison. That's it. His friend John was put into prison. Let's move forward. Right? That's, That's it. Jesus is an awesome man. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. And then it says in 16, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for there were fish for they were fishermen he simply said in verse 17 come and follow me jesus said and i will make you fishers of men at once they left their nets and followed him verse 19 when he had gone when he had gone a little further down the road he saw james son of zebedee and his brother john in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, Jesus called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Ordinary men, these four men. Ordinary guys. Probably no formal education, no whatever, and here's Jesus. 
walking along and say, follow me. They leave their jobs, they leave their everything, they leave their family, and they instantly follow Jesus. And granted, Jesus has been walking a little bit, and they've been hearing who he is, and they know who he is by John the Baptist and so forth and so on. But they stop what they're doing, and they follow him. In the Lent season, we need to stop what we're doing and expect God to give us something, period. Even if that something is just pure rest, something God wants and is always, not just in Lent, wants to give us more. We need to be ready to be prepared, as John says right here, John the Baptist prepares the way. We need to prepare our heart, soul, mind, and strength to be ready when Jesus is calling us to get up and move. It costs them. It costs every single person we've read so far, but we didn't read their full story, so we're not going there. We need to be ready. We need to be ready to act. We need to be ready to receive. We need to be ready to believe what, in what Jesus is giving to us. Like the others, we need to not, the paralytic man and the paralyzed man, the leopard man, we need to not believe what people say about us or what we say about ourselves. We need to believe what Jesus Christ says about us. Okay? There's another one I'd like to read. <clears throat> and it is Mark 2, hopefully I have my references correct. Mark 2, 13 through 14. Mark 2, 13 through 14. <clears throat> and this one is called the calling of Levi. Okay? Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alf, I'm going to just say Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow, he, Jesus says, follow me. And Levi got up and followed him. Just for fun and giggles, I'm going to read the next part. So follow me on, on 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Right? Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. No way. That lawbreaker. For there were many who followed him. I'll go ahead and read the next verse. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? I bet you guys can answer that question. Remember that, going back to our original text about that rigid, rigid old, worn-in piece of cloth, and we put that new piece in? Well, Jesus, in this case, the Pharisees are those old, worn-out piece of cloth, thinking people. And we're putting that new gospel into that new vessel, and that vessel doesn't want to receive that it's not ready to receive it. That's why they're asking the questions. That's why they're not understanding why Jesus is sitting with sinners, why he was even talking to Levi. Levi is a, Levi's a Jew. And the Jews are under the control of the Roman Empire. And this guy is a tax collector for the Romans. And he's probably taking a little bit and putting it in his pocket too as he's collecting it. So no one likes Levi because he's a tax collector. He's working for the Roman government, the enemy. So people think ill thoughts about him. And quite frankly, his friends at his house for dinner. And, and um, so they get a bad rap. Jesus came for them too. Came for the leper guy, the, the untouchable. He came for uh, the paralytic guy, the guy that needs help desperately that no one would help but his four friends at this time. He came for the four disciples, the four fishermen. And uh, he came for Levi, this guy who is a tax collector working for the Roman government. Um, 
And quite frankly, he came for John. And quite frankly, he came for God. And um, we're not going to there right now. What I want you guys to see is we need to prepare our hearts. What does that look like? I don't know what it looks like for each one of us. I don't know what that looks like. Is there sin? Is there a way of thinking that we need to remove? What is it that is in our lives that is hindering us from moving forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ? What is that? You know, is it too much time on the TV set? Is it, who knows, the world could, it's, it's huge, you know, it's huge. So, who knows? I'm going to go back to our text that we started out with originally. I'm going to reread it to you. Just to let you guys know, I like the older NIV versions. I copied and pasted the new one into my folder, and it doesn't read as well as this one. I like this one better. So I'm going to read Mark 2, and uh, I'm going to read 18 through 22. And I'm going to do it a little slower as I feel led. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Remember, John's disciples don't have John in their presence right now. He's in prison. Okay? And the Pharisees were fasting. This was a custom for many of the Jews at that time. They fasted twice a week, usually on a Wednesday and usually on a Friday. It's a good thing to do, fasting. It's an excellent thing to do, especially as you feel led by the Spirit for whatever reason we need to fast. Fasting can be for anything, just to grow deeper in Christ, to confess sin, to, to pray for sick and loved ones, to anything and everything we can fast for. But they had a ritual, they had a custom, and they fasted twice a week, usually Wednesday and Friday. And they simply weren't understanding why Jesus' disciples were not fasting at this time. And Jesus is a renegade in a sense, but for God, right? And, and he says to them, how can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he, is with, while he is with them? He's calling himself the groom. He's calling the people with him the guests of the bridegroom. All he's simply saying there is, I told you who I am. Are you listening? I can forgive sins. I am Christ. I am he in a sense. Listen. Open your eyes. Read your word. Don't think. Don't be rigid. Don't be like those wineskins, like that piece of cloth that won't take a new piece of cloth. He's saying, look, open your minds, open your heart. Open. Open up. I'm here, as we read further, if we were to read further, he's here to fulfill the law, not to close it, not to change it. He's here to fulfill it. And he's saying, I am he whom you are looking for. That's what he's saying. This is not the time of fasting. I am right here in your presence. It is a time to celebrate it is a time to feast, in a sense. And I don't know about you, but our culture has Thanksgiving, and I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is one of my favorite times because our family, I'm looking at my mom back there, our family gets together for a week. Usually Tuesday, people start to pour in. And we have conversations, and we have catching up, and we have laughter, and we have frustration. And we have eating and eating and eating and eating and eating for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Saturday usually. It's a wonderful time. Could you imagine that whole time I'm sitting there 
and everybody is all together and no one's eating and no one's celebrating. We're just like, for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. (laughs) We're in the presence of one another. Lent has a tradition and it is for 40 days, Monday through Friday, we fast. And on Sundays, we feast. And, and, and the idea is there is that on Sundays, we come together like we are now. And we worship our Lord in celebration of what he has done. In celebration of what he did 2,000 years ago by dying and, 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 and raising again and sitting at God's hand. And in hope of the future of him coming again. That's what the feast is. The feast on a Sunday for Lent is that coming together of celebration of us. Even if people are at home, we're still together. We're still praising. We're still worshiping our Lord. And that is the feast that is spoken of. God is saying right there in that little scripture, I am in your presence. It is a time to feast. And just just for fun, you guys ought to go through the Bible and look at all the different times Jesus has instructed the, the people of God to have a feast. And quite frankly, it lasted a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. It's wonderful how God wants to take care of us. On the other side of that, there is a time for fasting, And in this fast, we need to be prepared, as John taught us. We need to confess our sins. As we saw in in the other scriptures, um, we need to be desperate to get to God. We need to be ready to receive, ready to say yes. A time of Lent is fasting and searching our hearts and our souls and our minds. It's a personal fast more than it is a a fast for other people, but it can be that. There's no real rule. There's no real rule, but this is a time of intimate searching of our own heart, of our own mind, of our own will and strength to find what God is wanting to give to us. And I truly use those words, want to give to us. Okay? So, I don't think I'm going to go over all that because I don't want to be labored. I don't want to labor you. But I do want to finish in saying that as we enter, which started last Wednesday, as we enter this time of fasting, I want you to be just like God, Think about this. God reached out and touched the leper. God's, God reached out and, and saw the disciples and called them to him. If we fail in our fast, it doesn't mean to stop. It just means to get up, and I like this word, shake the dust, and move forward and ask God for forgiveness and move on. Or just ask God for strength or whatever it is that we need and move on. God is reaching to us and touching the untouchable. I don't see us as untouchables, but we might think of ourselves that way. God is reaching out to us. He wants us to know him more, to know him intimately. He doesn't want our hearts so rigid that we can't receive what he wants to give to us. He wants our hearts pliable and malleable, ready to receive. Not only to receive, but to expand and to breathe and to give. That's what he wants. He wants the best for us. Just like I want the best for my children, the best for my wife. That's... That's what we need to do for the Lenten season. Let me make sure that I have what I have written down said. I think I'm pretty good. I just want to say this in closing. So, 
just to let you know the message, its name, even though it's about fasting, even though it's about Lent, it is prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts for this journey that we're going on for this journey with looking for our Savior and getting to know him more intimate. I've been walking with him for a very long time and I get to know him more and more every time I read the scriptures and every time I sit down and pray. Here's what I'm going to close in. And then um, it says to prepare your hearts for an encounter with Jesus. Prepare your hearts for an encounter with Jesus. Father in heaven, we come before you with our hearts open, our minds, our soul, and our strength is yours, Lord Jesus. As we prepare for this week, Lord, and as we prepare for this uh, time of celebration and this time of fasting, I pray that you would speak to us. Move in us, Lord. Help us to see how you are moving around us and within us, Lord Jesus, and help us to be able to uh, move with us, uh, move with you, Lord, I pray. I thank you for what you are doing, Lord Jesus, because it is awesome. And I pray that we are with you in the future, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So let's go ahead and stand for the benediction. And we have a tradition where we hold our hands out to receive the benediction. And this comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Peace, everybody.